You're probably looking at the title of this video and thinking, what the hell, Dev? What's this all about? Obviously, we all know what a purity spiral is. It's a social ratchet effect within a community, a process of moral outbidding, unchecked, which corrodes the group from within, rewarding those who put themselves at the extremes and punishing nuance relentlessly. At least that's what's on an Urban Dictionary. There's no Wikipedia page in the concept, and you'd think there would be. Not to be confused with virtue signaling, woke culture, or online mobs. A purity spiral can contain all of those things, but it's defined by the fact that it takes place in a defined community or society, where being purer than thou is always being rewarded, and holding a divergent, less pure opinion is normally punished. A dynamic which leads to an inevitable escalation, as only the most extreme can win. This is a pretty good definition, actually. It could be anything from Mao's Red Guard, to neo-Nazis, to The Crucible, that's a play about witch hunts, to Instagram knitting, that's a reference to an article about how, back in 2020, an online knitting group got radicalized towards leftist politics, because of that tired mantra, everything's political, an event that began the prominence of Karlin Borisenko. If you've been plugged into internet politics since Gamergate like me, purity spiral is probably a term you've picked up and mastered long ago. We all know what it is. We can all see one when it happens. And if you're honest, you'll accept that any political camp, any group at all, is capable of a purity spiral. Though I do know that right now they're commonly attributed to the left. And with good reason. The fate of Trotsky at the hands of Stalin after the death of Lenin. The fate of the Gang of Four at the hands of Hua Gofeng, and soon after Gofeng at the hands of Deng Xiaoping after the death of Mao. The terror under Robespierre, which eventually took his own head. There is an impulse embedded deep within the left to strive for ideological purity. If you believe that you are truly creating the perfect society, if your goals are just that righteous, it becomes easy to view people not as pure in their convictions as you as lesser than. It also becomes easy to commit horrible acts as you strive for that utopian vision. But purity spirals are not the exclusive domain of the left. Religious puritanism and ethno-nationalism contain similar impulses, and those examples are so well known that I don't think I need to list them. In terms of the online sphere, we're currently seeing the final destruction of two political communities due to purity spirals. Firstly, BreadTube is basically gone. It's shattered, broken, destroyed by its own infighting. For a long time, they were emboldened in their advocacy against Trump during the 2020 election, but that's done now. At the same time, they were all united in their hate of destiny, somebody who considers himself as being on the left, even though he vehemently rejects socialism. But destiny is now banned from Twitch. So, isolated within the decaying husk of a once vibrant movement, they began to turn on each other, fighting over drama and clout, self-destructing in the process. Secondly, Lauren Southern just put the final nail in the coffin of the dissident right, as she puts it, in a nearly three-hour video describing all the worst excesses of every prominent online right-leaning figure she'd ever had the displeasure of working with. Paul Joseph Watson, Ezra Levant, Faith Goldie, Milo, Tommy Robinson, and how after the money and clout began to dry up, they rapidly turned on each other, and her, in order to get ahead. The only person she had nothing bad to say about was Stephen Molyneux, which surprised me, frankly. I always thought there was something a little bit off about him, but hey, I'm happy to be wrong. Purity spirals are clearly a destructive element within a community. If your group suffers from one, you're on a downhill trajectory fast. Your group will stop being about its purpose and morph into being about its prominent members until everything of value has been sucked out of it. So why do purity spirals keep happening? Do they actually serve a purpose? I mean, from an evolutionary standpoint, strictly, I know we evolved tribal tendencies for survival purposes, but purity spiral seems to completely undermine that impulse. I have no idea what the answer to this question is, but I've had a few thoughts over the past couple months that I want to share with you. Let's assume that, for the sake of extreme simplicity, there are only five moral questions. We'll label them one to five. And there are only two possible answers to each question, A and B. All in all, 10 total moral positions. Now, assume a person who believes that the moral answer to all five questions is A. So to him, all five A's are moral and all five B's are immoral. Within his domain, the five A's are allowed and the five B's are banned. Five of the total of 10 possible moral positions are permitted. Now let's assume a second person, who believes that the moral answer to the first four questions is A, but the moral answer to question five is B. If they come into contact with each other, they have three choices. One is to just remain separate. Two is to go to war over their different moral opinion on question five. And three is to live and let live. In other words, the first person, despite his moral compass telling him to ban 5B, permits the second person to indulge in 5B. And the second person, despite his moral compass telling him to ban 5A, permits the first person to indulge in 5A for the sake of peace. In a society where only the first person existed, there were five permitted moral positions and five banned ones. But in a society where these two people have chosen to coexist, there is now six permitted moral positions and four banned ones. That's what tolerance ultimately is, when you allow other people to do things that you personally view as immoral, but don't have a direct stake in. Now imagine a society that is filled with people such that at least one person believes in each of the ten possible positions. 
In order to take into account everybody's morality, such a society would have no moral prescriptions. This is ultimately why people who preach open-ended tolerance end up defending the worst crimes, including pedophilia, even if they're not pedophiles themselves. Because tolerance demands that they take into account the pedophile's moral position in their calculations of a universal morality. The morality is universalized in that it tolerates all individuals within it and allows each of them to follow their positive moral impulses. But necessarily, it also has no advice to give anybody on what they shouldn't do because, to steal a phrase, nothing is true, everything is permitted. Postmodernism is, therefore, the end result of our attempts to craft a universal morality that takes into account every single human's desires. But frankly, I personally don't think I need to consider the point of view of the pedophile when I'm figuring out my own moral code. This process is the opposite of the purity spiral, and it's equally destructive. While purity spiraling destroys communities from within, rotting them at the core until there's nothing left, and expelling most people out, universalizing morality castrates a community, rendering it unable to take any action lest one of the many individuals within it object. Consider Antifa. They're a particularly radical section of the left that has destroyed property, assaulted people, even killed people on occasion. They are certainly the result of a purity spiral, and we have seen many people leave the left in response. But has that weakened the left? I mean, it kinda has, but not nearly as much as we all thought it would, say, five years ago. Antifa has been allowed to run roughshod over civil society for nearly a fucking decade at this point, every time something happens that they don't like. Purity spiraling has indeed stripped the left of a lot of its moral legitimacy in the eyes of unaligned people. It makes them out to be hypocrites and thugs, and it makes exiles the more lukewarm members. But even as the left is saddled with these weaknesses, purity spiraling also generates some strengths for them. The overton window shifts leftward. The national conversation is about something more extreme, closer to the radicals' desires. Dissidents are weeded out to prevent them from causing trouble, and instead those dissidents join the enemy's camp, broadening and therefore weakening their moral prescriptions in the process, while the radicals' morals become more focused. Suddenly, your enemy is more willing to compromise, as your former moderate positions have become theirs. A violent, uncompromising sect of the most radical individuals may isolate your movement from the wider culture, but it's also a method by which concessions are extracted. I heard in a recent video, I think it was from Jordan Peterson, that the estimated number of Antifa members is actually quite small. It does not take that many free riders or criminals or people who simply just don't care and who would just as soon see everything burn to radically destabilize complex social organizations. I spoke recently with the journalist Andy No about the anarchist group Antifa, for example. After being informed by some Democrats I was corresponding with that this group, Antifa, didn't really exist. I didn't know what they meant until I asked Andy how many truly active Antifa cells he thought existed in the US and how many active full-time equivalent members each cell might have. He thought 40 cells with 20 members each. That's 800. All that damage from 800 anarchists. That's the Pareto principle. A small number of agents in any organization, or its equivalent, pull all the weight. And look at the change they have forced from the silent majority that just wants them to go away. In a sense, purity spirals are simultaneously how the left has destroyed itself, and at the same time, how it's pushed its agenda. And I think the right is getting wise to this, and has begun doing the same thing on their end. Here's the issue, though. Just because this is an effective short-term strategy doesn't mean I actually think it's good for society, nor do I think it unearths any sort of actual truth. Quite the opposite, actually. This is where you get people who are happy to disregard the truth, shredding the social fabric all the while for political expediency. We're just barely hanging on with the left doing this. There's no way we'll make it out if the right starts doing it too. And yeah, I've been in my comment sections for the past few videos. The right absolutely does it too. There's at least a very vocal minority of people angry with me that I don't blindly ideologically agree with every single view that they hold, and how it's somehow a betrayal or a leftward drift or whatever other nonsense, because they found me attacking the left. So why am I attacking the right too? My brother in Christ, I am a centrist, I am a classical liberal, and I have been for many years. Maybe you need to consider that if my logic sounds based and amazing when I'm critiquing the left, but cucked and idiotic when I'm critiquing the right, that the problem might actually be your view of the world. But if you're part of a purity spiral, you probably won't actually consider that. By the way, I'm fine with right watching me. I'm also fine with left watching me too. This is still a free speech zone at the end of the day. You can tell me how wrong you think I am in the comments, and I will tell you how wrong I think you are in the videos. But I reject the radicalism, the purity spiraling, from any and all sides, and I have no time for the tears of people who thought that I was one of them. I'm not a rightist. I'm also not a leftist. Even if purity spiraling can be a solid short-term strategy, I think it destroys everything if you engage in it. There's a better way. 
And that better way is what centrists do. I don't need to expel people in order to bolster my ideology, nor do I need to extract concessions through extremism or negotiate with others who try to extract them from me. I don't need to compromise with subversives. I don't need to engage in Mott and Baileys or respect that tactic when used by others. I don't need to dog whistle, nor do I react to them. I don't need to care about optics. It's not like I have a reputation to uphold. At the end of the day, the truth is the truth, and it forms the best defense that we have against radicalism. The truth is incontrovertible. If you're a radical and you're wrong, no amount of further radicalism would convince me to do anything other than oppose you. Why would it?